A healthy woman has higher levels of testosterone than she does estrogen. By applying topical caffeine ointment or cream to the scalp and suppress PDE sufficiently enough to increase IGF-1 and increase some hair growth or at least maintain hair growth. Hair growth itself is strongly regulated by hormones such as estrogen, thyroid hormone, insulin-like growth factor, and that other hormones, in particular the androgens, so things like testosterone, but mainly its derivatives like dihydrotestosterone, are very much involved in setting the stage for hair growth by controlling how big or small that pool of stem cells that gives rise to hair growth is. Every single hair that you have is there because you have a stem cell population that is giving rise to that particular hair. We have the hair itself, which has the shaft that sticks out over the skin, it goes a little bit into the skin, but basically sticks out over the skin. We have the root portion, which goes down into the skin. It goes through the epidermis and into the dermis. Then we have this bulb-like region down at the bottom. Down at the bottom of that bulb, we have stem cells that actually give rise to the actual hair. And we have pigmenting cells that pigment that hair. In addition, and this is very important, there are capillaries that go into that bulb region down at the bottom of the hair. And that can serve and support the stem cells the melanin producing cells, which are called melanocytes. So the melanin producing cells and the stem cells get a lot of blood flow that allows them to keep providing new hair or the proteins that make up hair and the pigment that goes into those hairs. And those little capillaries deliver not just nutrients and things of that sort, but they also deliver oxygen because it turns out that the whole process of growing more hair is a very active process. Now, well, as soon as you hear oxygen and you hear that the growth is an active process, that should cue you to why so many of the stories around how to keep your hair and regrow hair involve statements like, don't wear a hat, it'll make your hair fall out. Or if you want your hair to grow back, you know, don't wear hats or massage your scalp or increase blood flow. Or why some people will uh, suggest that people take peppermint oil, for instance, or menthol type oils of different kinds and massage them into the scalp, things that make the scalp tingle. Or there will be light therapies designed to increase blood flow to the scalp. The whole rationale there is that you're trying to increase blood flow to the stem cell and the melanocyte populations that support the hairs and that actually create the hairs. Now let's talk about the accelerators on hair growth and the breaks on hair growth. There are many accelerators on hair growth, but the first one that I really want to underscore is blood flow itself, which equates to the delivery of nutrients and oxygen. This is very important and it explains a lot of the treatments for halting and reversing hair loss. For instance, one of the longest standing treatments for halting and reversing hair loss is so-called minoxidil. Minoxidil, sometimes also referred to by the brand name Rogaine, was actually a drug that was developed to treat hypertension. So this is a cardiac drug that lowers blood pressure, and it does that by causing vasodilation. It allows more blood flow, not just to the hairs on your scalp, but to hairs everywhere on your body. And indeed, most people don't realize this, but minoxidil won't just slow the loss of hair from your scalp. It is also effective at slowing the loss of hair elsewhere in your body. How does it do that? One of the major ways it does that, it does that by extending the antigen phase. So it basically makes that phase a bit longer. It doesn't make it much, much longer, which is why for most people who are losing their hair quickly or who have already lost their hair, minoxidil alone is not going to be a sufficient treatment. It tells you that blood flow and delivery of oxygen and other nutrients from the blood is pretty critical, if not very critical for the support of the hair growth cycle itself. Minoxidil does have other effects, and this is why dosing of minoxidil becomes a little bit complicated and can be a little bit tricky to troubleshoot. It can greatly lower blood pressure or lower blood pressure just a little bit, depending on how sensitive somebody is to that particular drug. So oftentimes physicians will start people on minoxidil dosages that are very low. Ideally, that would be the case. And then ratchet it up in order to figure out where the minimal effective dose or the kind of critical threshold is beyond which they start experiencing some 
pretty uncomfortable side effects, such as you know swelling of the ankles or headaches or dizziness. These things can happen with the use of Rogaine, aka minoxidil. People who take minoxidil, especially if they're very sensitive to it or they take dosages that are too high, will experience increases in prolactin that in turn can cause things like reductions in libido, reductions in overall feelings of well-being, apathy, and in some cases, where the elevations in prolactin are more extreme, they can experience, uh, for instance, increase in male breast tissue, gynecomastia, or even small bits of milk let down. Nowadays, there are more and more doctors who are familiar with this requirement for blood flow, understand the mechanisms by which minoxidil works, and understand the vast desire out there for people to hold on to the hair they have and regrow hair. And they're prescribing things like low dose Tadalafil. So 2.5 milligram to 5 milligram Tadalafil. Tadalafil was initially discovered as a drug to treat prostate health. It was a drug that we now know can increase blood flow to the prostate and thereby offset some of the issues associated with an aging prostate. Higher doses of Tadalafil, sometimes also referred to as the by its brand name, which is Cialis, are used to treat erectile dysfunction, but at the dosages that are used to increase blood flow to the prostate, and that now a number of doctors are using to increase blood flow, not just to the prostate, but to all regions of the body, including the scalp, such as 2.5 to 5 milligrams to Dalafil. Mechanical stimulation of the hair follicle and the stem cell niche using what's called microneedling. Microneedling, as the name suggests, is taking a bunch of little needles, either in a little stamp, so a little square, or nowadays, typically it's a roller. So it looks like a, a paint roller, except it's um, got tons of little needles in rows all over that roller. Those needles range in length from half a millimeter to 2.5 mil millimeters, okay, millimeters. And one rolls that over the scalp. And if you're thinking, ouch, that probably hurts. Indeed, it can hurt a little bit or a lot, depending on the thickness and the length of those needles. And for those of you that are hearing this and thinking, why would disrupting the skin with needles actually support hair growth or regrowth? Wouldn't that just damage the follicle? Well, this gets into some of the, um, I think, interesting, if not fascinating aspects of our biology, which is that all of the cells in our body really can respond to both chemical and mechanical cues. And when we hear needle injected in the skin, we think, ah, oh, that must just be damaging everything, causing all sorts of inflammation. But it turns out that low levels of inflammation caused by things like microneedling or PRP injections, or even the introduction of any kind of fluid, right? For instance, saline fluid injected into a region can cause changes in the cells in that region, causing, for instance, stem cell populations that were waning to reactivate again. So microneedling procedures, PRP injections, things like minoxidil, they all kind of center around this same general theme of increasing blood flow, increasing oxygen, delivery of nutrients, or in the case of microneedling, increasing inflammation just enough at that local site that certain cascades of biological function that relate to proliferation of stem cells or maintenance of stem cell populations are kicked off. People with cutis verticus gyrata almost always experience pattern hair loss. Now, part of the reason for that is cuticus verticus gyrata is also associated with some androgen or testosterone related hormone issues that we'll talk about in a little bit. But in addition to that, it has been shown that relieving some of those gyrata by injections of Botox to allow those folds to sit flatter, A, is effective. It can lead to less of those gyri, those bumps, and can improve hair growth in those regions, even if those people don't take on any additional treatments to address the hormone issues. There are a couple of key chemical players here that we should all be aware of. First of all, the growth factor IGF-1, insulin growth factor one, which is produced by the liver, but that receives stimulation from the brain and pituitary to be released, is a strong regulator of hair growth. And we can think of it as the accelerator on hair growth. So it does that by extending that antigen or growth phase for longer. It doesn't necessarily speed up growth, but it extends it for a longer period of time. In addition, Cyclic AMP, which is part of what's called a second messenger pathway, in fact, cyclic AMP is a second messenger, is also a key player in stimulating growth of the hair follicle. We can start to think about why, for instance, half of 
all people by age 50 start to lose their hair. Well, they start to lose their hair because of something called androgen related alopecia, which translated to English means testosterone and testosterone derivative induced hair loss. And this is true in men and women. So hearing that, you should probably be wondering the following thing. Young men have higher levels of testosterone than old men, right? Well, the answer is yes. Although some older men in their 40s, 50s, even 80s maintain testosterone levels similar to many men in their 20s, but most don't. It's a downward slope starting at about age 40. How steep that downward slope is depends. Women too have testosterone. In fact, women have higher levels of testosterone than they do estrogen. Androgens such as testosterone and its derivatives, such as dihydrotestosterone, inhibit IGF-1 and cyclic AMP. Again, androgens such as dihydrotestosterone inhibit, prevent the action of IGF-1 and cyclic AMP, which you just learned a few moments ago, act to extend the antigen or growth phase of hair, which then raises the question, well, if young people both male and female, have higher levels of testosterone than they do when they're older, why would people lose their hair when they're older and not younger? Ah, the answer lies in the conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone. Testosterone, most people have heard of, dihydrotestosterone or DHT is made from testosterone. There's an enzyme called 5-alpha reductase that converts testosterone into dihydrotestosterone in both men and women. Dihydrotestosterone binds to the androgen receptor at five times the affinity of testosterone. So it is the most powerful androgen in humans. And it is responsible for a number of things that we all really want and like, such as mental vigor, physical vigor, strength, healing capacity, drive, libido, and on and on. So DHT itself is not bad. So if we take a step back, and we acknowledge testosterone levels are higher in males and females at younger ages as opposed to older. But as they get older, there is more 5-alpha reductase activity, which is converting more of that testosterone to dihydrotestosterone and dihydrotestosterone inhibits hair growth by reducing IGF-1 and cyclic AMP. Well, then we should all be aboard why it is that by age 50, about 50% of people experience pattern hair loss. That is androgen dependent alopecia. So now I'd like to discuss the ways that one can chemically adjust certain things within the hair growth pathway, things like IGF-1, PDE, TGF-beta, et cetera, in order to stimulate hair growth or halt hair loss. The first thing on this list is actually going to be pretty surprising to a number of you, and that's caffeine. Caffeine does many things besides stimulate our central nervous system and make us feel less sleepy, however. One of the things that caffeine does is it is a fairly potent PDE inhibitor. By being a potent PDE inhibitor, it indirectly stimulates IGF-1. Why? Well, because PDE can suppress IGF-1 and by ingesting caffeine or by applying topical caffeine ointment or cream to the scalp, you can suppress PDE sufficiently enough to increase IGF-1 and increase some hair growth or at least maintain hair growth in that region. Keep in mind that topical caffeine ointments shouldn't necessarily be applied every single day. So this is the sort of thing you might do three times a week. The concentration of caffeine in different ointments varies tremendously. Most of the studies of caffeine on the stem cell niches that control hair growth and extension of the antigen phase of hair growth have been performed in vitro in a dish. Although there are some clinical studies exploring this, they are not nearly as extensive in number or duration as the studies of minoxidil because this approach just hasn't been around quite as long. However, when comparing side effects of minoxidil, cost of minoxidil, comparing the efficacy of caffeine and minoxidil, I think caffeine as a topical treatment for offsetting hair loss stands as a pretty good choice if you're going to start exploring this pathway. And there's no reason to think that if you were to try the caffeine ointment and it didn't work for you, or you didn't like it for some reason, or you needed to stop it for some reason, that you couldn't stop it safely because it doesn't carry all the other kind of blood pressure related effects and prolactinemia effects that minoxidil does. The other thing that's really important for maintaining proper hair growth, this antigen phase, is that you need sufficient iron. This is because iron and ferritin play a key role in the cell growth pathways that go from the stem cells to the stimulation of keratin within the hair itself. Anything that reduces 5-alpha reductase is going to reduce DHT 
is going to maintain or extend the growth phase, the antigen phase of hair growth, and is going to offset or prevent some of the telogen phase, the pinching off and the removal of that stem cell niche. Now, one substance that we know can inhibit 5-alpha reductase, although it does it pretty weakly, is sol palmetto, which is an extract of the sol palmetto berry. Another commonly discussed and used commercial compound for offsetting hair loss and stimulating hair growth is ketoconazole. Sometimes this is known as Nizorol, where Nizorol is the brand name of a shampoo. Ketoconazole is an antifungal that was initially developed to treat dandruff and severe psoriasis. So ketoconazole has been shown to be effective in increasing hair number. It's also been shown to be effective in increasing hair diameter, which is somewhat surprising because one of the common side effects of ketoconazole is drying, thinning, and brittle hair. Ketoconazole acts as an antifungal that in some way seems to reinforce the properties of sebum at keeping out other fungal infections. And the net effect, at least as far as we know, is a mild reduction in DHT. Now, exactly how this happens isn't really clear. What is clear is that the use of ketoconazole shampoos two to four times per week with a scalp contact time of about three to five minutes has been shown to give about an 80% response rate of maintaining hair that would otherwise be lost. Now, if you decide to use ketoconazole as an approach to offsetting hair loss, it's very important that you get a hold of a shampoo that's at least 2% concentration of ketoconazole. This is important because a lot of the ones that are available out there, especially online, are going to be 1% or lower. So you want to try and obtain a ketoconazole shampoo of 2% or higher concentration of ketoconazole because it has other things in it, of course. The major player in this whole story around inhibiting 5-alpha reductase and reducing DHT to maintain or increase hair growth is going to be finasteride and its close cousin, dutasteride. Finasteride is effective in reducing DHT because of its actions in reducing the type 2 isoenzyme or isoform of 5-alpha reductase. Finasteride treatment done properly can reduce hair loss in 90% of all people that take it. And in addition, it's known to increase hair thickness by about 20 to 30% overall. Finasteride comes in two major forms. There's an oral form and there's a topical form. Why was finasteride developed in the first place? Well, finasteride as a fairly potent 5-alpha reductase inhibitor, it's great at lowering DHT. It was developed for treatment of prostate enlargement and various issues of the prostate that are associated with elevated DHT that occurs with age. The topical finasterides were designed with the hope that the finasteride would make it into the hair follicle and would inhibit DHT there and allow for more growth of the hair, which apparently it does, but not make it into the systemic circulation or at least not at concentration sufficient enough to cause as many side effects as with the oral dosing. Now, the problem is it does make it into systemic circulation. Combination treatments that involve a mechanical stimulus and a chemical stimulus are always going to be better than either one alone. And within the mechanical category, the stimulus that seems to work best is microneedling. So the combination of microneedling and finasteride can lead to some pretty robust and impressive hair regrowth. So my suggestion is that anyone who's thinking about embarking on various treatments for offsetting hair loss and stimulating hair growth, consider both mechanical approaches and the approaches that attack the chemical pathways that can stimulate hair growth and can inhibit the inhibitors of hair growth.